Vin Future Prize, a new global science and technology prize for humanity from Vietnam. One Vin Future Grand Prize of $3 million. Three additional special Vin Future Prizes valued at $500,000 each. Vin Future Prize honors science and technology work that creates or has a high potential to create meaningful change in the everyday lives of millions of people. Join us to make a change for a better future. Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I have a question for you. If you can choose a metaphor to define or to describe this phrase, cancer measurement at the point of care, which one will you choose? What is coming to your mind or your brain right away? Uh, please share with us your thoughts in the chat box so uh, we can interact with each other and I believe there will be a lot of amazing ideas. Um, with this question being asked around to so many people, we have a lot of answers and uh, one of them, I still remember one of the very simple but very interesting uh, ideas um, that I, I have heard about, uh, about the precision medicine. It's like when you order a designer to customize your own shoes, which perfectly fits your feet and with special characteristics that belong only to your body. Basically, with uh, precision medicine, the healthcare is individually tailored to someone's, uh, to someone on the basis of person's genes, lifestyle or environments, uh, etc., with the goal of targeting the right treatment to the right patients at the right time. It's very interesting, isn't it? Uh, and today, uh, I, we really want to share with you, human being, we are now able to do this, all of this, because of the considerable advances in genetics and the growing availability of health data, uh, which leads to the opportunity to make precise, personalized patient care a clinical reality. And with today's webinar, we are going to find out why personalized medicine instead of one-size-fits-all treatments and then we are going to get familiar with powerful discoveries that can help improve chances of survival and reduce the exposure to adverse effects. We are very honored today to bring to you in our webinar the world leading scientists in this field and um, because of their talent, their passion and of course years of their contributions. Please let us welcome the chair of today's webinar, Professor Chi Van Dao, member of the Vin Future Prize Council, scientific director of the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research. Welcome Professor. And let us welcome our special speaker, Professor Brian T. Cunningham, Intel Alumni Endowed Chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Director of Center for Pathogen Diagnostics, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Welcome, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, we have prepared a video introducing the topic today, and then our chair, Professor Chi Van Dao, will start the story of cancer management at the point of care. Video, please. Welcome to the second Vin Future Innova Talk. You are invited to the conversation about cancer, the disease that is widely believed as incurable or worse, the one-way door to the end of life. According to World Health Organization estimates, by 2040, the global cancer burden is expected to reach 27.5 million new cases and 16.3 million cancer deaths. Due to the fact that survival rates decrease by approximately 30 to 40 percent after cancer spreads from the original site to other body parts, the need for early diagnosis is critical. Great news is, the development of point-of-care cancer diagnostic solutions can help overcome barriers to early diagnosis and efficient treatment for different cancer types. Imagine using a liquid biopsy, a portable, easy-to-use, rapid, low-cost and reliable tool. Only a few drops of the liquid sample, such as blood or urine, is taken in place of tissue for cancer detection. How amazing does it sound? In the upcoming episode of the Innova Talk series by Vin Future, let's talk about revolutionary techniques for cancer measurement at the point of care and the future of precision medicine in oncology. The webinar will be chaired by Professor Chi Van Dang, member of the Vin Future Prize Council, scientific director of the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research. And certainly over the last two decades or more, we've seen, witnessed 
the transformation of cancer research from those fundamental uh, discoveries. As long as we can, you know, save a few lives by doing research, I always say that each life is a world, so we like to save many worlds. The main part of the conversation will focus on the innovations of the distinguished speaker, Professor Brian T. Cunningham, Director of the Center for Pathogen Diagnostics, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. We are interested in a mutation that would tell the clinician right away uh, what specific FDA-approved drug uh, they could give to a lung cancer patient who comes into the clinic that day. Uh, so rather than you know, taking lung cancer tissue, sending it out to a, a lab, uh, waiting more than a month to get the results back and to interpret them, um, they'd like to be able to know that result uh, within an hour or two. They could, they could send the person home with their therapy regimen started right at that point. And that, that project is starting to show success. Coming soon on July 26, 2022, 9 a.m. Vietnam time, which corresponds to July 25th at 7 p.m. in Los Angeles and 10 p.m. in New York. Are you ready for the next Innova Talk? Good evening, uh, good morning, and a good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to this uh, second Innova Talk series of Fit Future. And the topic, as you already heard today, is the uh, cancer measurement at the point of care. And we're very fortunate to have Professor Cunningham to really address some of the unmet need in terms of the technology to really enable us to diagnose cancer with a most minute amount of material that it can recover from a, an individual. Um, so, so the challenge, uh, I'm a had been a practicing medical oncologist in cancer research. I think that one of the big challenge for uh, cancer doctors is when a patient comes in, as you heard already, is to be able to make the right diagnosis and then to be able to tailor the therapy to that particular patient so that you get the best response possible. While we have witnessed immunotherapy curing various types of cancers, there's still many, many patients who do not respond to the latest therapies. So the question is why don't these patients respond? And it really, the understanding of better diagnostic and better combinations of drugs will allow us to really cure more cancers. Importantly, one of the things that we're looking forward to the future, which you'll hear more from Dr. Cunningham, is prevention. So are we able to detect cancer at the very earliest stage, very earliest stage to be able to intercept or to really get rid of that cancer at a very earliest stage? And I think this is really one of the biggest challenge currently in cancer research. And clearly this, uh, this requires multidisciplinary approach, such as engineering that you'll hear about to bring the latest technologies so that we can get the most sensitive measurements, uh, cancer measurement, if you will, at point of care. So uh, with that note, I just want to turn this over to Dr. Uh, Cunningham to uh, tell us about some of the innovation that uh, his laboratory has uh, developed to really address this particular issue. So Dr. Cunningham. Well, thank you very much for the your kind introduction. And uh, your greetings to everyone throughout the world who's uh, joining the, the uh, webinar today. Uh, really grateful for your time and uh, your, your attention to uh, this important issue. And I just like to express my gratitude to the uh, the, the Vin Future Prize Foundation uh, for the opportunity to uh, share some of the things that we're working on uh, here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and start the presentation. And does that look okay? All right. Uh, so, so the topic of, of my presentation today is the cancer measurement at the point of care. And even though I'm a faculty member in electrical computer engineering, my, my background is in you know, electromagnetics and micro and nanofabrication, um, I, I'm very fortunate to work with a very talented interdisciplinary group of you know, graduate students. Yes. Oh. oh, no, thank you for letting me know. I thought I thought I had hit the correct button. 
Let me try again. Oh no, I think I think we're I think we're in good shape. We practiced. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So, so importantly, I wanted to acknowledge at the beginning uh, the, the graduate students and postdocs, a very interdisciplinary group of you know, electrical engineers, bioengineers, and chemists uh, that are actually doing the work that I'll share with you today. Uh, we're fortunate to have funding from several uh, sources like National Science Foundation and NIH. And, and very importantly, um, this work is very multidisciplinary. And so there's faculty in cancer research, uh, chemistry, biochemistry, bioengineering uh, from several research institutes throughout the U.S., uh, such as Dr. Aaron Mansfield at Mayo Clinic, uh, Dr. Villanueva at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, and Manish Kohli at Huntsman Cancer Institute in Salt Lake City, Utah. And so I'm really representing a much bigger group, and, and we've formed a, a research center called the Center for Genomic Diagnostics. And overall, our strategy is to use um, cancer genomes revealed by extensive gene sequencing uh, of you know, patients, you know, tumors at various stages of uh, cancer advancement. Uh, but you know, gene sequencing, even though it's very informative, is also expensive and slow. And so we, we use the information from genome sequencing to understand you know, personalized genomes and to get an idea of what specific biomarkers we might want to detect um, out of a droplet of blood drawn from the finger or, or drawn from the vein that we might want to perform liquid biopsy upon and measure on a more frequent basis. So the idea of a liquid biopsy is a you know, non-invasive procedure um, that you could do you know, frequently, uh, but still uh, would be very sensitive, quantitative, fast, uh, low cost, uh, so that you could do it uh, on a repeated basis. And there, there's many molecules that can be the, the biomarker targets for liquid biopsy, uh, several different types of nucleic acid biomarkers as listed here, uh, but also uh, metabolites and proteins. Um, I, I'm going to focus today on um, genomic biomarkers like microRNA and circulating tumor DNA. But, but the basic idea is that these molecules can be measured quantitatively, and if they're measured at very low concentration, um, you can you know, see the transition from normal physiology uh, to cancer and the development of mutations and how they progress uh, throughout cancer. And then this information can be used to guide uh, your treatment and, and to monitor for recurrence. So the idea here is that you know, cancer testing you know, should be performed on a routine and repeated basis. Okay. Um, all, the way, um, all the way from you know, early detection, which is maybe the most challenging, where you're trying to detect the lowest concentration molecules, but also you know, finding and measuring you know, specific biomarkers uh, that can be used to uh, help choose the treatment, uh, to measure the effectiveness of the treatment while it's ongoing, and then to monitor the person even after treatment for, for months and even years afterwards. So our, our clinical collaborators are, are steering us towards these types of tests that can be like simple, <laughs> rapid, uh, performed inexpensively, even in, in the clinic. And with these kind of features in mind from an engineering standpoint, uh, we're looking for approaches that can be like room temperature, you know, single step, and can be even used to digitally count molecules, even if they're present at like atomolar concentration, where atom molar is very low, uh, it, uh, 10 to the minus 18 is what an atom is. And, and even with these requirements, we we're interested in doing these tests on a couple droplets of blood, not having to take you know, a quart of blood out of a person uh, to measure these biomarkers. Uh, so in, in my talk today, what I'll share with you from a technology standpoint, uh, the new paradigms for diagnostic tests that we're developing uh, in this Center for Genomic Diagnostics where from an engineering standpoint, we're developing ultra-sensitive technology platforms that are even able to count molecules individually, which we call you know, digital precision or digital resolution. And we're combining these biosensing technologies with ultra-selective biochemistry approaches that are able to recognize molecules very specifically, even if they have just one base difference in their genomic component. And so we, with these biochemistry methods, we're developing the, these diagnostic tests. Uh, and so in, in my talk today, I'll describe a specific technology called uh, photonic crystals uh, or photonic crystal biosensors. 
and a digital resolution counting technology that uses photonic crystal biosensors on this called photonic resonator absorption microscopy. But don't worry, if you're not an engineer, I think this will make sense. Uh, it's not that complicated to explain. And then we were using this um, technology for detecting a variety of molecules, seeking to get the, the detection limits very low while also making the test very simple and fast. And so I'll describe how we do that. And then if I have a little time left at, at the end, I'd like to share with you some things that are really new, but also very exciting, uh, and things that we're doing for detecting circulating tumor DNA. And so um, this uh, structure uh, shown here in cross-section is what we call a photonic crystal. And it's a crystal because it has a periodic repeating nanostructure that's made out, out of a low refractive index material, such as plastic or glass, um, that has a high refractive index material, such as titanium oxide deposited on top of it. Now, we design and fabricate this structure to be an optical resonator, and I'll, I'll describe what that is in just a minute. But, but the basic idea is, if we have this photonic crystal structure, it's designed to be a really strong reflector for only one wavelength of light, we designed the structure to be a strong reflector for the wavelength red. In this case, red has a wavelength of 625 nanometers. At that red wavelength, the structure has very strong electromagnetic fields on the surface. And what we can do is to take a gold nanoparticle. So this gold thing up here is a gold nanoparticle. When we put it on the photonic crystal, um, it gets dunked into this strong electric field on the surface. And, and we we designed that gold nanoparticle to be a, a very strong absorber for the same wavelength that the photonic crystal resonates with, in other words, red. So when that gold nanoparticle gets attached to the photonic crystal, what we can observe from the outside is the very strong red reflectance uh, getting quenched and being like lower reflectance. So what used to reflect red at a strong efficiency, now it gets reflected red at a lower efficiency. So that's pretty cool from an engineering standpoint. And, and what is interesting is that we can make these photonic crystal structures very inexpensively. Um, we can use um, integrated circuit foundries to make them on eight inch diameter glass wafers and then cut them into little pieces as shown here. And this whole surface is a photonic crystal and we can interface it with something that holds liquid, just like a, like a little rubber gasket that can hold little six small liquid compartments each of this, these compartments can hold you know, a few droplets of a test sample. So looking at the photonic crystal with a microscope from above, we can see the, the periodic structure here. And then this shows a few gold nanoparticles kind of sprinkled around the surface. You can get an idea. Uh, these gold nanoparticles have a diameter of around 100 nanometers. So they're small. They are, one of these gold nanoparticles is around the same wavelength as a COVID virus, for example. Um, so um, we, we developed a microscope called a photonic resonator absorption microscope shown here in the lab. What it's comprised of is pretty simple, that we have a red LED, shines light at the photonic crystal from below. The reflected red light comes back through a microscope objective. And in this first instrument, we sent the light into a spectrometer so we can measure that reflected spectrum that I showed you earlier. Um, this version of the microscope costs about $200,000 and takes about an entire four foot by eight foot optical bench, uh, but still works really well from an engineering standpoint. Uh, more, more recently, we uh, demonstrated a portable version of this instrument that's shown here. That's about the size of a large toaster or coffee maker um, that has about $7,000 worth of components. Um, here, we eliminated, we eliminated the spectrometer and some of the complicated uh, scanning stages that we use for computer controlled motion uh, because we didn't really need them. Uh, so here we just have a low intensity red LED uh, illuminating the photonic crystal from below. And the reflected light just goes into a webcam quality image sensor that costs about $500 uh, as shown sitting out here on the edge. Uh, so we can reduce the size and the cost of this instrument significantly so it's suitable for being in a, a clinical environment. And in fact, we're even now working on a, a book-sized version of this PRAM instrument that we call the PRAM Mini uh, that has about $500 worth of components and then we'll even link by Bluetooth to a smartphone. So uh, about a year from now, I'll be able to share with you 
uh, like a, a very small and very inexpensive version of this instrument. What these instruments all do, however, is to measure the attachment of gold nanoparticles where we can count and see each individual one. So the, the effect of one gold nanoparticle is to reduce the reflection from the photonic crystal from like high reflection intensity to low reflection intensity. And when we look at that reflection intensity in an image, we can see each individual gold nanoparticle stands out very strongly with high contrast and we can count them. So, so that's good. That, that's our, our basic engineering capability is counting gold nanoparticles. So, so what can we do with that? Uh, so one of the first things we did was to construct a biological assay for detecting cancer-related microRNAs. And this uh, technique is called Activate, Capture, and Digital Counting, or ACDC. What we do now is to prepare the photonic crystal with single-strand DNA of a special sequence that we choose, uh, shown here with green circles representing the, the, the DNA sequence that's on the photonic crystal. Then we can prepare our gold nanoparticles uh, with a specially designed probe molecule that we call a toehold probe. This uh, toehold probe is designed specifically for detecting a target microRNA sequence where we have this special part of the toehold probe called a protector. Um, when the target microRNA molecule encounters this probe, um, it will displace the protector. So by a process called strand displacement, the protector will go away. And now the microRNA molecule is incorporated onto this gold nanoparticle. Now what the protector was protecting was this a segment of green DNA that's sticking out on the end. So now when our microRNA comes along, the protector is gone. This green sequence of DNA is available, which is an exact complement for the DNA that was on our photonic crystal. So in this way, we can convert one microRNA molecule into one attached gold nanoparticle, which we can then count with our instrument. And so using this approach is very par powerful because we can very efficiently do this process and, and count nearly every microRNA molecule that was in the test sample for willing to wait long enough. Uh, so each of these little squares represents one pram image. Each little white spot represents one gold nanoparticle. And you can see how if we go to, if we wait for two hours and, and we go to from low to high concentration, we see greater and greater accumulation of gold nanoparticles. And so in this way, we can just analyze the images, count the gold nanoparticles. And in this way, we can make a dose response curve for detecting that microRNA that has a detection limit of around 100 atomolars, uh, which represents actually very low concentration. And so the nice thing about this process is that you notice that there's no washing steps, no enzyme amplification, room temperature, um, very simple process to do, um, even could be done in a clinical setting. Um, we did this recently for our first set of clinical samples in collaboration with Mount Sinai Hospital uh, for detecting uh, microRNAs associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. And just to really briefly share with you some of the results, we were able to differentiate the HCC patients from healthy patients by looking at the concentration of three small non-coding or small um, RNAs. Uh, they have um, numbers designating them, uh, designating their sequence. And, and by using our dose response calibration, we could even estimate the a concentration of the RNAs uh, pretty accurately and with uh, very low coefficients of variation. Um, we, we didn't like waiting two hours. And so one of the things that we did was to um, engineer our gold nanoparticles to incorporate some iron, uh, which would make them paramagnetic uh, so that we could capture them or draw them to the photonic crystal biosensor surface with a magnet. Uh, so we did some work to synthesize gold iron oxide paramagnetic nanoparticles that are strong absorbers for the same red wavelength of light that we liked previously. Uh, but then we could place a stationary magnet underneath the photonic crystal biosensor during the incubation process and do that same AC-DC assay that I shared with you previously. And so once again, uh, we have the protector getting displaced by the microRNA target, and then we capture the magnetic nanoparticles to the surface. So in this case, we could reduce our assay time down to only one minute and still have the same 100 atomolar limit of detection. So just very briefly to, to share with you, 
Um, these are pram images from our portable instrument. Each little black sprinkle is one detected microRNA molecule. And we were able to show uh, getting the detection limit down to 0.1 femtomolar, which is same as 100 atomolar, um, if we have our magnet in place for about a minute. Um, we, we could even go down to a, about half a minute if we wanted to, but a minute is a pretty you know, good amount of time for doing an assay like this. Um, and so we, we also showed recently the ability to, to detect microRNAs directly out of human serum, again, having these 100 atomolar detection limits and, and, and doing this kind of assay very rapidly. Um, not, not content with that, uh, we've been further developing our approach to reduce the limits of detection even further uh, with a process that we call target recycling. So uh, for saving the environment, we all love recycling uh, because you can use the same item over and over again. And so the idea behind target recycling for our assay is that we would um, do our strand displacement process in a little different way where our capturing strand with the protector is linked to the photonic crystal at first rather than the gold nanoparticle. Um, just like before, it will capture our microRNA target, uh, which will remove the protector. But now we have a second process where the gold nanoparticle will um, remove the microRNA so that the microRNA can undergo this process many times, actually one molecule getting detected over and over and over again. And, and so in this way, we showed with this target recycling amplification process that happens at room temperature, a single step, uh, no enzymes involved at, at all, um, we, we could again use our PRAM imaging approach um, to get this detection limit down to about, uh, about one atomolar, so about um, 100 times lower limit of detection, uh, which actually represents only five or six molecules in the test sample. So in this process, because of the amplification, it takes between 10 and 20 minutes. Here, here shows our dose response curve uh, for uh, black, 10 minutes, 20 minutes is the red curve. We accumulate more particles if we wait a little longer, but the 10 minutes is actually sufficient to get down to about 100 atomolar limits of detection. Um, well, what's amazing about this uh, strand displacement biochemistry is how selective it is. Um, even if we introduce a, a single base difference from our target microRNA, and place the single base mismatch at several different locations within the microRNA. Uh, if, we, if we change the target molecule, our probe won't detect it. And so what, what this plot shows is non-detection of single nucleotide variants um, that are a thousand times lower concentration than our detected variant. Here, this one representing our target. Uh, this represents about 3,000 to one selectivity, uh, which is uh, like very remarkable. Um, we, we've demonstrated the ability to uh, multiplex this type of assay. So with a, a single uh, fluid containing device on our, on our, on our photonic crystal, um, here we're showing detecting three different microRNAs at the same time. Um, and then uh, recently we, we showed detection of, of uh, microRNAs from cancer cells in culture. Uh, in this case, uh, we have cancer cells in culture they generate extracellular vesicles from which we extract the microRNA and then detect them with our PRAM system. And so um, this, this shows um, detecting from MCF7 cancer cells uh, detection limits down to about two atomolars in this case. And uh, since we were producing these microRNAs from cancer cells, we were able to also perform uh, PCR on them. So in this tape, in this case, a uh, quantitative um, RT-PCR and to show directly comparing ourselves to PCR, that our detection limits are around 300 times lower, yet we're still able to use our dose response calibration to quantify these molecules uh, very accurately. And so in, in the last couple of minutes, I wanted to quickly share with you one other thing we're doing that hasn't been published yet, but I'm just excited about it. And, and so I think people will appreciate um, another application in cancer diagnostics is detecting a molecule called circulating tumor DNA. So, so DNA you know, comes from um, cells. Um, if you have a small number of cancer cells, the cancer cells will actually produce DNA that carries the mutation in its genomic sequence that will circulate in the blood. Um, however, uh, healthy cells can also produce DNA that, are, uh, that don't carry the mutation. 
And since we're mainly made up of non-cancerous cells, um, the uh, cancerous cells are a big challenge to detect. And so the idea here is that the wild type DNA represents non-cancerous. The circulating tumor DNA represents uh, DNA that comes from the tumor. And the, the thing, the way we quantify this is by something called the mutant allele frequency, which is a fraction of the DNA that comes from tumors compared to all the DNA, most of which does not come from the tumor. So to, to give you an idea how challenging this is, um, this, this is a, a gene associated with many types of cancer, but also lung cancer. So this is a gene that's of interest to our collaborator at Mayo Clinic, that if he finds this mutation in the EGFR gene, the mutation is called L858R. This mutation is only one base out of the entire gene that the wild type has a T in this position, the, the cancer mutation has a G in that position, and that's it. That's the only difference between a uh, non-cancerous and cancerous uh, version of this gene. And so here we're using a different type of detection method. I'm using the CRISPR-Cas technology that you may have heard about in the context of gene, um, um, gene silencing and, and, and genetic, um, genetic editing. Uh, but the CRISPR-Cas chemistry can also be used in a very powerful way for diagnostics in the following way. So, so here's our healthy gene. Here's the, the sequence for the healthy gene. Here's the change from T to G representing the mutation. What we do is to design a special probe molecule um, called a guide RNA that's able to open up the double-stranded DNA and to make a very nice matchup with the exact sequence that we're trying to detect that carries the mutation that will, that will not have this interaction if it's the wild type. And, and to do this, we need an enzyme that's called Cas12A, represented by this uh, blob kind of surrounding the double-stranded DNA. And the, the thing that occurs that, that's special is that when the Cas12A enzyme comes together with the guide RNA, and the guide RNA matches the mutation, this Cas12 enzyme will go from being silent to being what we call active. And, and when this Cas12A enzyme is active, it will go and cleave any single strand DNA that it can find. And actually that's its function in gene editing is to make cleavages to single strand DNA. We can use this, um, this uh, thing to our advantage for diagnostics in the following way. So here's our, our good old gold nanoparticle and here's our activated Cas12A enzyme. And when it's activated, if we have our gold nanoparticles tethered to a surface with single strand DNA, um, that Cas12A enzyme will go, when it's activated, will go and cleave those off. Um, so we, we developed a new assay method that we call activate, cleave, capture, and count. Actually, uh, so three C's in, in there. It has two steps. Uh, step number one, we perform in one a little test tube that does the activate and cleave steps. Then we have a second tube that has our photonic crystal biosensor in it for doing the capture and counting part. So let, let me walk you through it. So we start off in tube number one with a glass surface that has millions of gold nanoparticles tethered to it, where part of the tether has single strand DNA. Um, we we uh, mix this test sample uh, with the Cas12A enzyme and the test sample and the guide RNA all come together. And so now here's our Cas12A enzyme represented here in green, that when it comes together with our circulating tumor DNA sequence and our guide RNA, will go and cleave gold nanoparticles from the surface. But once that cleavage happens, the um, Cas12A enzyme will keep going. It will just keep cleaving and cleaving and cleaving um, any single strand DNA that it can find. And so in a short amount of time, it can actually produce thousands of released gold nanoparticles. So we release the gold nanoparticles over here in this tube. We take the liquid and pipette it into this tube that has the photonic crystal in it um, that has some capturing molecules that will quickly capture all the gold nanoparticles that it can find. And so um, this first step takes about an hour. The second step takes about 15 minutes. But in, in this way, we can get down to very low detection limits for detecting circulating tumor DNA. And so here I'll show you the uh, dose response curve 
for detecting the EGFR mutation uh, going from 5 femtomolar all the way down to 50 zeptomolar, which is even below atomolar. So in this case, um, this point represents only three molecules in the sample. And in this case, we can derive these samples from, um, from about a milliliter of serum coming from a cancer patient. And so um, well, what's interesting about this is that look at the non-detection of the wild type. So here, even if we have one base that's different, we can increase that base by five orders of magnitude and doesn't give us any signal at all, which means that we can detect the, uh, the mutation uh, very, very selectively. And so uh, th this selectivity is good enough that we can differentiate the uh, mutation from the wild type uh, by about um, 0.001%. Um, this gets down to this idea of the mutant allele frequency, where with this capability, we think we can get down to about 0.001. So on, on this chart, I've uh, plotted out where other competing technologies get down to. Um, so droplet digital PCR is here. Another technology called beaming is about 0.01 mutant allele frequency. Uh, so we, with this approach, it takes about an hour. Um, we, we can get down below that. Uh, so hopefully in, in my in the short amount of time, it's a brief overview of the technology and some of the applications we're developing. In this case, uh, taking new modes of microscopy using photonic crystal biosensors and the ability to count gold nanoparticles that can be associated with um, individual molecules we want to detect. In this case, uh, microRNAs as cancer biomarkers and also circulating tumor DNA. And overall, our, our goal is to make these technologies you know, inexpensive, simple, also they can be performed in point of care settings such as in clinics, and then, then use these technologies for detecting a small panel of biomarkers in such a way that could guide a clinician uh, for uh, choosing therapy, um, telling whether or not therapy is having an effect on the concentration of these molecules, and for monitoring people over the long term. So thanks so much for your attention, and um, I'm excited for the discussion to come and to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Professor Cunningham, I guess um, I would just make a few comments. That was absolutely a fascinating um, presentation illustrating the kind of innovation that uh, you and your laboratory and colleagues are working on. Um, we really look forward to all the successes so that this can be implemented in the, uh, the clinical space to make a difference to cancer patients. Uh, could, could I just maybe start out asking the first question and open it up to, to the audience is, um, as you're innovating in this space, um, what do you see potentially as a timeline and what would it take for this type of innovation to actually to make it to the clinic uh, with, with the best possible scenario? Yes, yeah, so, so excellent question. And so you're starting from a, like a, a technology that works. And so we, we have a you know, technology that's pretty robust from the standpoint that it's in my laboratory. We even train undergraduate students how to do it and grad students and postdoc visitors come and use it, but it's still a capability in my lab. So the, the next step that we're doing is building uh, replicas of our instrument and sharing them with our collaborators at Stanford and at Mayo Clinic. And then my students are going out there to train them to do the same assay. While at the same time, uh, we're uh, writing research grants together, uh, getting you know, financial resources from NIH um, where uh, we can do clinical studies, uh, where, for example, we have an NIH grant uh, with Huntsman Cancer Institute um, that's gathering 112 um, serum samples from advanced prostate cancer patients, uh, where we will measure their microRNAs um, on a daily basis for a month uh, while they're undergoing chemotherapy to see how we can measure changes in five microRNAs um, over the course of that month. And, and so we, we have the ability to uh, do those tests with our technology, but we also have to benchmark them against a gold standard technology, uh, such as PCR and droplet digital PCR. So, so the path is really doing clinical studies, um, having uh, researcher collaborators who can validate the technology, then using you know, some like very important use cases that are representative of other cases. So, so now we have a project for prostate cancer biomarkers. 
Uh, we have another one for microRNA from breast cancer that's with Carl Hospital in uh, Champaign, Illinois. Um, we have the, this third project with uh, Mount Sinai Hospital for small RNAs with um, and hepatocellular carcinoma. So we're kind of like slowly expanding our sphere to different types of molecules and different types of cancer. Uh, and so meanwhile, we're, tr we're trying to start a company. And so we're, we're talking to investors, um, trying to get a like, venture capital investor to help us develop a product uh, that we can like, build, commercialize, and you know, find um, you know, partners who can like, do larger studies and, and to validate it even further. So it, it's a lengthy road, I'd have to say, that, that um, you, I think for something as important as diagnosing cancer, um, that it has to be very robust and has to be proven before it would actually be used for making diagnos diagnoses on people. So I think it'll undergo you know, like a, a research phase for a while uh, before it's it's validated thoroughly enough that it will be used to actually you know, guide clinical decisions and to do like early diagnostics for cancer. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, perhaps I am going to open up whether to the audience, whether there are uh, questions for uh, Professor Cunningham. I do not see in the chat space questions, or maybe I can um, address a couple of uh, issues around the type of technologies that you are innovating. Um, as uh, some of you may know, a, a recent publication from uh, the Vogelstein uh, laboratory at Johns Hopkins showed that um, very um, sensitive detection of these mutant circulating tumor DNA actually can have a clinical impact because if you look at patients with stage two colon cancer, that once uh, the patient has undergone surgery, if you cannot detect circulating tumor DNA, then the patients probably will benefit from not getting adjuvant therapy, chemotherapy that can be, you know, quite difficult for the patients. So I think that that just illustrates that, you know, that is a real clinical application. I guess the, the other challenge we have in the field, and maybe you can address this from a technology perspective, is the level of false positives um, in the type of detection method, I, you, you illustrate very nicely that you can distinguish between mutant, for example, circulating tumor DNA versus the wild type. Um, what, is the, what is the potential level of false positive uh, given that you are counting particles and what is the lower limit that one can sort of draw the line below which you won't you know, count that as a, a real signal? Yes, and in fact, that's what we're trying to characterize. And, and typically, the limit of detection that you can go down to is dictated by the false positive rate, as you mentioned. And so in a process such as PCR, and specifically like digital PCR, you, you have PCR reactions that are happening in like your nanoliter scale volumes. And so uh, an event that, that can trigger an amplification in a nano volume like that will be seen as a positive event in the assay. And, and the rate of false positive events that happen because the PCR process started incorrectly because the, the, you know, the primer kicked off the process and it started amplifying. Um, once it starts to amplify, it doesn't stop. And so that, that event becomes positive. So we're, the approach that we're taking is using a fundamentally different biochemistry based on, on the CRISPR-Cas. And so we have to design those, you know, guide RNA probes carefully so as to not to kick off activation uh, even when one base is different, namely like the wild type base is present and not the mutation. So, we're, we're, so here we were starting with this one mutation, the EGFR mutation, and showing the selectivity is higher than PCR for that one probe for that one mutation. And so, yeah, obviously we, we have to keep you know, building our library of mutations, which is what we're working on now. But, but the, the CRISPR-Cas biochemistry has different 
fundamental basis and then PCR does, which we're showing allows us to get down to lower false positive rate, which effectively is what gets down to lower mutant allele frequency. Then the, the other question um, I have, uh, actually there's a, looks like there's a question for you from uh, the audience. Uh, the question is, would your lab system be suitable for tracking cancer evolution and monitor the response to therapy through examining patterns of circulating tumor DNA? Um, yeah, so that's an excellent question. And in fact, that, that is one of the things that is, a, one, is our like, target application is like measuring therapy effectiveness by measuring changes in the you know, biomarker molecules, um, you know, concentration um, as a function of time during therapy. And, and so typically you know, with, with microRNA and also circulating tumor DNA, that if the tumor is removed, you know, the level drops, like plummets, because you know, the source of those molecules is gone. Um, if the tumor is being, if it's being treated and tumor is shrinking, also, the, the level of those molecules will decrease. And, and so um, doing molecular measurements is a nice proxy to imaging because you can do it non-invasively um, with a couple droplets of blood, hopefully. Uh, and, but, but imaging might tell you, okay, the, the tumor shrank by 30%. Um, and so you have to get the person in for an imaging and, and, to, and to look at that tumor uh, very carefully uh, to see you know, changes. So what we're hoping is that the molecular tests can be performed you know, less invasively, less expensively, more frequently uh, as a more effective way of monitoring uh, treatment effectiveness. And I have another question for you, which is, can we use different types of gold nanoparticles with different shapes rather than the gold urchins? So that's a, the first question from this. Yes, um, yeah. We, we, we discovered that we like the urchins. And so we, we, in, in the previous work, we've experimented with uh, gold nanospheres and gold nanorods. Um, and so you can get gold particles in many different shapes and sizes. Um, the good thing about the urchins is that their um, enhanced surface area is excellent for uh, coupling high density of surface chemistry. Uh, and then though those urchins um, can remain small in diameter, while still being an excellent match for our photonic crystal resonance wavelength. And so um, we, we found that we, we like those. They're also commercially available. Uh, so we can actually buy them in almost any diameter that we please, uh, even in 10 nanometer diameter increments. And so we, we found that to be a, a nice commercially available product that we can uh, buy and use in our tests. And then the uh, related question, which I uh, hope you uh, could answer, which is how can you control the chemical modification of tethering chains, including Cas12 enzymes to the nanoparticles? Um, so so that, that, that process actually that takes a little bit of, of skill in the surface chemistry. And I really have to credit my collaborator, chemistry professor Yi Lu, um, who's currently at University of Texas at Austin. Then a, a really brilliant chemistry graduate student, Luke Aiken, uh, who developed that process. And, and so um, if, if you recall my, my diagram, there's a little bit of a chain. I'm not sure if I should share my screen again just to, to, to bring that up. Let me try. Yeah, so hopefully you can see this, that, that we, we want to have the single strand DNA be slightly away from the glass surface uh, so that um, it's nicely available, doesn't have any steric we hindrance. Actually don't, we don't ah, see your screen. There we go, okay. Now we, now we so, so we like the single strand DNA portion to be displaced a little bit away from the surface. Uh, but then when the single strand DNA gets cleaved, um, we have this streptavidin molecule that's linked to it by one end where we can use the um, streptavidin um, binding pockets to attach to biotin on our photonic crystal. So there's a, there's some um, expertise actually goes into engineering this uh, sequence that results in the, in the single strand DNA there. Terrific. I also see there may be some additional uh, questions coming up. We'll wait for those to come up. 
Um, so, so I have a question for you. So uh, we um, greatly celebrate innovative technologies such as yours as they evolve, but clearly at some point when this is implemented, um, the cost of these tests probably initially will be challenging. What is, what is your perspective on uh, what you're doing? I know you're miniaturizing the instrumentation, but the actual, if you were to foresee the future, the material that's needed, um, you know, is this going to be scalable in terms of uh, being economically uh, feasible? Um, yes, that is also really excellent consideration. It's something we think about carefully. So and in terms of like the materials and supplies to do the assay, uh, the photonic crystal costs about a dollar per assay at this point. Um, the um, gold nano urchins are, are fairly inexpensive also. That they're, they're synthesized at a company and we, we buy them um, you know, they kind of like by the, I guess we buy them by the microgram, but, but not very many of them are needed to perform a test. And then the, the molecules that we use in the tests, like the, um, the probe molecules, we have those synthesized by IDT. So they're all the synthetic, um, these are all synthetic DNAs, which are much less expensive than things like, like antibodies um, and enzymes. And so the, the, the cost per assay is reasonable. I think it's currently for us doing it in, in my lab, it is something like $5 per assay. And so I think if it were implemented on a manufacturing basis, things that would actually dominate the cost would probably be more like, like the, the packaging and the, you know, the company's you know, technical support and marketing and things like that. Like, like the price that people pay for technology is actually a lot more than the cost of doing it. But in this case, the, the cost is not prohibited. Oh, that's thank that's you, Professor true. Cunningham, and uh, thank you, Professor Chi. Uh, I'm sorry for interrupting you because um, I just realized that there are so many people are raising hands now, and I just want to spend a little bit time for them to um, to uh, to ask some questions, and um, maybe I will steal some minutes from uh, two of you. Uh, and uh, before I uh, let some people who are raising hands to ask your question, I really want to say thank you to a lot of people here. I can recognize in this meeting room, we can see a lot of uh, familiar name and familiar faces uh, who are leading scientists and researchers uh, around the world from many countries in this field. And uh, we would like to say that we can see Professor Terry Allen from uh, University of Alberta, Canada, and Dr. Lim Ming Fan from the MD Anderson Cancer Center from USA. Uh, and we also can see a group of professor and researcher from Hanuk Medical University. Thank you for being here today. And also a group of professor from Hai from the Medical University. And um, uh, we can see that uh, the professor from Hanuk Medical University is uh, raising your hands. Uh, can you uh, unmute your mic and uh, send the question to our speaker? Please, professor. Hey, good morning. Uh, thank you uh, so much for uh, the presentation. So congratulations for the outstanding uh, research. I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first, so you said, so if for, for this uh, uh, technique, you use uh, liquid biopsy. So you mean this uh, the, the blood taken from the patient or just a liquid? Uh, that was taken from the, uh, I mean, the, the tumor or both. That's the first question. And the second is that, so have you ever tried uh, to fo follow up? I mean, the, 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 the marker using this technique for the one patient uh, before and after treatment and compared to another conventional method uh, to show uh, showing the uh, advance and this advantage of, of this, that's the second. And the third, and uh, uh, you also uh, just saying that uh, this uh, ap approach can can be used for both uh, uh, microRNA, uh, DNA, or protein. So how how how, how can you? I mean. 
uh, do with uh, the, 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 the biomarker is protein. Okay, so oh. thank you. I know, no, thank you for your yeah, excellent questions. And so uh, in the limited amount of time, uh, I wasn't able to go into all the details of things that, that we've done or are doing. Uh, and right now there's two different types of samples that we're gathering for microRNA. Um, the, the first is, um, is gathering uh, four mLs of plasma uh, through the uh, vein in the arm. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the plasma is, is processed uh, by our collaborator at Stanford that extracts the exosomes uh, with, a, with a special technology they have for uh, rapidly um, concentrating exosomes from plasma. Then we get the, um, for our test, um, we get the exosomes, break them open, and then detect the microRNA with our test. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one method. We have a separate project where the, the cancer patients are taking droplets of blood from their finger and then putting them onto a filter, a filter paper collection kit called a HemaSpot kit, mm -hmm. um, where the, the patients do that at, in their homes, seal the kit, and then mail it to our laboratory, where we have a process for extracting the uh, microRNA um, out of the filter paper and then performing our test on the filter paper extract. And so the, the, those using those two types of samples, uh, we're doing the studies now that you mentioned, where we're, we're measuring um, the, the micro, exosomal microRNA uh, from patients with advanced prostate cancer at different stages of prostate cancer. So not, so not the same patient, but different patients at different stages of advancement. And then in the project with the finger sticks and the hemospot kits, that's the project where we're taking the same patient and measuring them at different time points uh, during chemotherapy. So we're, we're doing those studies now and they're not complete. And so I, I, I still you know, can't share the complete results with you about those. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've also developed assays for detecting proteins uh, using a similar approach um, using um, antibodies and secondary antibodies linked to the photonic crystal and to the gold nanoparticles. And so we, we also have like very sensitive assays for protein biomarkers, but I chose not to include those in the talk just to try to keep it a little bit better focused on the um, microRNAs and ctDNAs. Thank you. So once again, <laughs> congratulations for the, I mean, the very, very, yeah. Good uh, results. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hello. Uh, yeah, thank you very much as uh, the um, MC. And I would like to thank, thank very much uh, Professor Cunningham and Professor Dang Van Chi, uh, the two outstanding professors in the field. So I'm very ask me a Professor Dang Van Chi. So this first time I meet you in the end, uh, even by room, but I'm very uh, satisfied with uh, this meeting. So I have uh, two questions with Professor Cunningham. So uh, I'm very in, uh, I'm working in Osaka Metropolitan University in Japan in the department department of hepatologies, and I am also working on demethylation using a Caspar nine system. Uh, I'm very interested in your design for the uh, Caspar 9 using Caspar 9 system to detect early uh, circulating uh, free DNA. So whether you design the specific guide RNA and probe for each type of cancer, or you have uh, the common guide RNA for several types of cancer to, to be the kit of detection or not. So I am interested on that. It's the first, first question. And the second question, uh, you say you can detect the very low amount of uh, copy uh, DNA, uh, the mutant type. So uh, have you ever checked the 
the positively correlation between the, the time of detection and the amount of the cDNA. Thank you very much. Okay, well, so thanks for your questions and greetings to you in, in Japan. Yep. Um, so, the, so the design of the guide RNA is very specific uh, to the specific sequence that we want to detect. And, and in fact, it's, we, we use the thermodynamic principles and, and a, a software package to help us to choose the sequence uh, with the Gibbs free energy in mind. Uh, that, that's going to result in strong association and then the biggest difference in Gibbs free energy uh, between the uh, target sequence and the wild type sequence. And in fact, we again, because of time, I didn't share it with you. We, we, we go through a process actually of designing several prospective guide RNA sequences, evaluating several of them, and then choosing the one that, that works the best. And so, so we've been doing that on a, you know, for, for each um, mutation, we actually look for like its position within the gene, try to center it kind of like within the, within the guide RNA and to design that, that probe very carefully. Yeah. And, and so far we've only done this for four different mutations. So, so we, you know, this is still pretty new um, process that we haven't, yeah. Um, used extensively, but, but so far we've been successful in designing a probe for each sequence that we've sought to detect. And so, but over time, we'll have to continue uh, like proving this. I see. And then well, your second question, please remind me. So the second question, you say you can detect a very low amount of uh, circulating uh, free DNAs and how did you see, how whether you see the positive correlation between the early time detection with the the, la the amount of the uh, C C uh, C uh, circulating free DNA. Uh, so, so in this case, we're really just characterizing the detection method yeah. where we're intentionally doping the sample with the, um, with the wild type and, and with the mutation uh, DNA. Yeah. So, so we know the sequence that's been added. And so it, it should correlate um, because we're, we're, we're adding the uh, molecule um, like spiking it in at a known concentration. I see. Then you will make the threshold of detection. Pardon me? Then, then you you will make the threshold of the uh, amount of CDC at the NLA yes. for the detection time. Yes. Level. Yeah. And so and so and so another thing that, that we're doing, again, because the, the time limit I didn't include it in the presentation, is that we have a lung cancer um, patients that have had their lung tissue sequenced. And then we have like all the sequence information for the presence of specific mutations. I see, yes. And, and then we also have the blood from those same patients mm -hmm. for which we can look for the presence of the circulating tumor DNA for those same mutations. Oh, and what we find is that those, are, those two things are correlated, but not the same. But we, we can we can use the like the biosensor technology to um, you know to detect the circulating tumor DNA in the blood of lung cancer patients for whom we know have the mutation present from their tissue, if that makes sense. So uh, and so in that case we, we are finding a good correlation, but also our technique is more sensitive. Than, this, than the next generation sequencing. And so we also see instances where we can use our test to go below what was observable, um, would, would say that mutation not present in the sequencing, but we can still see low level uh, with our test. Yes, I see. Yeah, thank you very much.
Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I was quite fascinated by the rapid progress, Brian, that you've been making in in um, miniaturizing and and, uh, and getting the price down for 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 some of these tests. That's really uh, 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 you're doing that really amazingly quickly, and uh, and that uh, it's. Um, <laughs> I have to go to another room to be able to do that, actually. Um, so wh while I'm doing that, while I'm doing that, let me uh, con continue to say, say, you know, congratulate uh, Dr. Cunningham on the, on the progress that he's been making. Uh, I, there's a couple of things I wonder about. Let me see if I can can just turn this on now. That's not uh, ah. There, do you see me now? <laughs> there I am. Uh, hello again. So one thing I wondered about is, uh, have you got an idea of the instances of false positives or false negatives that you might be getting from some of your tests? Well, well so yeah, thanks, Dr. Allen, for your question. It is nice to meet you. Um, so at, at this stage, the, the, the things that I, I've shared with you have been like tests that we performed um, for like intentionally doping the biomarker into serum or plasma. So there's, there's really not an opportunity for making a diagno diagnosis with those. Uh, and then um, also doing detection out of the cancer cell media, um, where again, again, um, we, we know um, roughly that we're, we have a, a solution that has you know, a, a known concentration that we can validate with PCR. So from, and then uh, similarly uh, with other work that I shared with you today, for example, with the hepatocellular carcinoma patients, um, we, we had, you know, control healthy patients that we could differentiate from, from those that uh, were diagnosed positively for HCC. And so I, I wouldn't say that we've really challenged the technology yet from a diagnostic perspective to say whether we're making false positive or, or negative diagnoses. Uh, in, in this case, I, I would say that our work is mainly to characterize the capabilities in terms of you know, detection limit and selectivity, if, if that answers your question. Well, wonderful progress. You know, I, I was thinking when I saw the title of your, of, of your talk and, uh, and we were challenged to think about the future, you know, in my age bracket in British Columbia, we've been given uh, some free COVID test kits. And I had an opportunity to, I, I turned it out to be to test negative, but I had an opportunity to use it the other day. And I was just amazed at the sophistication of those, of those little tiny test kits. And I was thinking that wouldn't it be wonderful when we look to the future, if we could get to that kind of level of ability to do point of care testing for some of the common cancers. Oh, indeed, I, I agree that, that that, and I think actually the most challenging problem of all of them um, is the early diagnosis. Yes, because then you, you so say you have some kind of result. You know, the test shows there's there's this molecule there. Your microRNA three seven five is present at such and such a concentration then what? So you've detected a molecule and then that may prompt you to start getting scanned in different organs and looking for presence of a tumor. Um, if, if the you know, concentration of the biomarker is very low, it would also indicate the presence of a tumor that's very small and hard to detect. And so I think even differentiating you know, a false positive um, would be difficult. But of course, a false negative could be dangerous. And it means that the cancer is there, but you didn't detect it. it would, so I think as you get down to lower limits of detection, now you, you have a 
more of a problem. Maybe your, your false negatives are fewer, but then there's possibility for a positive, but who knows if it's false or not, depending on whether you can find the actual tumor um, from, from imaging approach. Well, the future is very bright and, and uh, keep up the good work. Oh, thanks. Thanks, thanks and thanks for coming today. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor, uh, for your question and also for the answer. And I've just received um, a very interesting question from Dr. Tun Thanh Nguyen. Uh, I want to send this question to Professor Cunningham and also Professor Dang Wenqi. I'm curious that does the heat generate from the combination of reflection beam and plasmonic effects from Go NNP will destroy the biomarkers? Please, Professor. Oh, ah, an engineering question. I'm so happy to, <laughs> to get one of those. Um, so so that, that's an interesting question, actually, because in, in, in this case, um, where we're using you know, gold nanoparticles that will absorb the energy from the, um, the red emitting LED. But you should keep in mind that we're not using a laser. We're actually using a very low intensity illumination that, that as far as we can tell, does not result in you know, heating of the gold nanoparticle or you know, denaturing of the molecules that are attached to them. And so we're, we're actually you know, seeking to not cause heating. And then the reason we think we can get away with that is because of the low level of, uh, low intensity of, of illumination that we use from our LED. So, so it's different from fluorescence. With, with fluorescence reporters, you have to zap them with high intensity laser to get enough fluorescence emission so you can observe it uh, with a detector. But, but in this case, um, we just, we're just observing you know, very small changes in reflected intensity from the photonic crystal. We don't need you know, very much um, you know, intensity to do that. Thank you very much, Professor, for your question, uh, for your answer, and also for the question. And I think that this interesting question has um, marked the end of our Q&A session. Uh, we know that we still have a lot of questions are uh, being sent to our um, Q&A box and chat box also. Um, and please uh, send us all the questions, all of your uh, concerns, all of your experience, or opinions, or even your innovations to uh, our um, email office at spinfutureprize.org. Once again, office at spinfutureprize.org. And we can help you or um, to uh, share this question to Professor Brian T. Cunningham later after this webinar. And uh, right now, uh, I just want to send this last question to Professor Chief and that chair of today's webinar. Do you have any thoughts to summarize and to conclude uh, the Innovate Talk, uh, the second one, the, uh, the webinar of us today? Please, Professor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I want to thank Dr. Cunningham for a, a really wonderful uh, presentation, giving us a lot of hope for the future that we will be able to see cancer at its very earlier stages, notwithstanding a number of challenges us today. But um, I think what this particular webinar also illustrate is the innovation that the Fincher, Vin Future Prize Foundation is looking for to celebrate and that could potentially make a difference to millions of people around the world. So again, a congratulations to Dr. Cunningham and I look forward to seeing your work making a difference to millions of people. And that, that will be my last comment uh, uh, as, as chair of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dang Wenqi. And Professor Cunningham, you have shared a lot about your projects and about your innovations and technologies. And right now, uh, do you want to share anything with the audience that has spent uh, more than one hour to, to be with you in this webinar? Well, first, thank you very much to everybody who participated today. And uh, I hope you uh, got, got some ideas of the things that can be accomplished with you know, engineers, you know, chemists, and you know, cancer researchers coming together to try to tackle these uh, very challenging problems. And I really appreciate the insightful questions and the discussion. So thank you to the, the you know, Vin Future organization for um, pulling together this event and just wish everybody all the best for, for their own research. And I, I welcome 
um, you have questions that you might have, if I can share information with you afterwards, um, please um, email me. I, I'd be glad to follow up uh, with you. Thank you very much. We are so happy to hear that you will uh, receive all the questions uh, through your emails. And we also hope that we can keep connecting with you in the future for uh, more upcoming projects together with uh, Vin Future Prize and, and also Vin Future Foundation. Thank you very much. And uh, we just want to have a little notice for you that uh, we will have the online survey after the webinar. And you can now check the chat box uh, for the link to the survey. And we hope that we can improve our uh, webinar series uh, through the time. And uh, for that, we really hope to uh, receive your feedback and also all of your opinions, comments, and idea for more things that we can do to, to make our webinar, our Innovate Talk series better. Thank you very much. And uh, for now, I just wonder, um, uh, before we end our webinar today, I just want to uh, repeat once again the philosophy, one of the philosophy that um, Professor Dak Banji have uh, mentioned uh, each life is a world, so we would like to save as many worlds as possible. And that's a very beautiful word that we, we would like to once again share with all of you as uh, one of the message of uh, our series webinar. And uh, right now, we would like to say thank you all of our audience for uh, attending our webinar today. And uh, we would like to uh, take a group photo with all of you. Uh, can you, uh, together with us, turn on the camera and be ready for the group photo? Thank you very much. We are looking at the screen and we have a lot of people who are now haven't turned on the camera. Um, Professor Terry Allen and uh, Dr. Liam Ming Fan and also Zun Thi Tu Tui. Tu Van maybe. Uh, a lot of other. Okay, so we will have three more seconds. For all of you to turn on your camera, we would love to take a photo with all of you so we can still uh, have a memory with each other after this uh, Innovate Talk. Thank you very much. Are you ready? One, two, three, smile. Thank you very much once again. Thank you all the audience. Thank you all the researchers and scientists who joined today's webinar. Thank you our chair and thank you our professor, uh, the uh, distinguished speaker. Thank you very much for now. See you again. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.